live in other places. Aha, uh -huh, awesome. Great. And then we are live. Awesome, let's do it. Uh, hi, I'm Yana. Um, really excited to have Eric Brewer here. Uh, just quick, this is Cafe Yana, uh, where I'm going to be doing bi-weekly streams, talking to really influential people in the open source ecosystem. So I'm really excited to have Eric here. Um, he is a legend and has accomplished many things in his career, but also just a very cool person. And, and I'm really humbled that uh, I was just some person that we met. I mean, we met at, um, what was it, KubeCon in Austin. And I, I just tweeted at you. And you're like, sure, Yana. Yeah, I'll happily explain the cap theorem to you on a live stream. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what it started. But I just want to introduce yourself a little bit. Thank you. Glad to be here and looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my, my hope is I, I'd love to learn about, like, when did you, like, when was your first exposure to computers? Uh, like, how old were you? What was the feeling? Uh, when did you write, like, your first program? Like, I'd love to, like, kind of start the early days. Sure. Well, uh, the very early days, I actually did a little bit of electrical engineering before I got to computer science. My dad was an electrical engineer. This was nothing fancy. This was like building, you know, doorbells and, and you know, little machines with relays, things like that. But it was fun, and I did some circuit work. And then a friend of mine, his dad, who was a comparatively wealthy doctor, we were, you know, middle-class family, did fine, but their family was able to afford one of these new Apple II computers. And so I started playing with that computer, and that really got me into programming. I learned basic and even learned a little bit of assembly language. And then I actually wrote some programs for him and wrote some programs for uh, my baseball league to do what we now call basic statistics summaries. Our little league had statistics when no other league did, which was kind of fun. But it was mostly just an excuse to learn how to program. And then eventually I you know, got more serious about it, learned other languages. I learned the, uh, the 88,000 assembly language for the new Mac, the first time the Mac you know, had a new processor in a while. And because no one knew 88,000 assembly language, that job was super high paying. And so it was like $25 an hour back in the 80s, which yeah. was crazy. Uh, versus like, I don't know what the local jobs would be, but you know, I'm sure I made five or something doing gardening, which was my previous job and not nearly as fun. So uh, worked on early Mac stuff and uh, eventually did some work in the cat industry because again my dad worked at Lockheed and so he didn't I wasn't his group but you know I got a summer internship with the, the CAD CAM group and wrote a bunch of stuff for them, learned Fortran, lots of things that you know I probably don't know today. And eventually went to UC Berkeley in computer science and that's when I got more serious. But I, I actually was professionally programming quite a bit before I got to Berkeley and that was unusual at the time. Yeah, that really is. But it seems to be the trend that I talk to people in the 90s, especially like people were like programming, right, to be able to like uh, steal music or to, to build little programs, right, for your baseball team. So it's always fun to hear how people got into programming right before. Uh, it's usually for a need to build something, which is which is cool. And it was just fun. You know, I'm a kind of introverted guy and just. And compared to electrical engineering, computer science is nice, and the machine kind of does what you tell it to do, <laughs> which is good and bad. But compared to circuits, I always found circuits to be a little bit unpredictable and they're harder to debug. And I like the kind of clean abstract model where the thing does what it's supposed to do. That's incredible. And then what inspired you to start like your first startup? Well, I was faculty at Berkeley at the time. Uh, I went to basically grad school at MIT and then got a job pretty young as faculty at Berkeley, uh, which is good and bad, but it meant that when I, the first thing I did research on was this idea that we could build internet services using clusters of commodity workstations. This is called the NOW project, Network of Workstations. I didn't start the project, but its goal was to be more like clusters of workstations for supercomputing, which was kind of the big dominant field of systems in the 90s. And so I came as a new faculty, I had to have my own kind of take on it. My take was, well, I actually think this internet thing's gonna be big and this web thing looks pretty cool. So we should build web services using clusters, which of course is the modern cloud architecture now, but at the time it was yeah. novel. And that led to having scalable large machines, which that said, 
oh, the thing that needs a scalable large machine is a search engine. Let's build a search engine. And that became uh, Ink Domain, which was the, the startup I started in 1996. 1996. Yeah. What was like that? Many like? people wouldn't have heard of Ink Domain, but it was yeah. the number one search engine of its day before Google. And uh, unfortunately, it's before the advertising market was really settled out and had the wrong business model. And Google was able to make the business model work with advertising. Over and much yeah. get regular money coming in was just a matter of time before they would deservedly have the best uh, search And what was, the, what was the landscape like? Like, was it difficult to get funding? Like, was it difficult to kind of build a company back then? Um, no, that was the, right the years leading up to the internet bubble. And so when Netscape went public in 1995, they kind of opened up a huge bubble market for VC investment. And in fact, our first round, we didn't take venture capital because we got much higher, like 4X higher valuations from private investors. We ended up taking VC money from Oak in the second round. That meant we actually had larger ownership of the company than we otherwise would have. And, you know, had that company had the, it's a crazy story how high and low it went, but we did own quite a bit of it because of that structure. And it was pretty yeah. easy to get money to answer your question. Okay, and so it was 1996, um, or like a bit too early, right, for the model. And, and, and what was the business model if it wasn't The added? business model was kind of more like Intel inside, be the engine of the search engine. And so we were the, the actual engine doing you know, what you now call services with an SLA, consumed by front ends. In this case, the first one was uh, Wired's Hotbot. And later we added, you know, Yahoo's engine, um, AOL's engine, and even Microsoft's engine. So Microsoft Search was powered by Ink to me for quite a long time. And there's a whole bunch of good stories there as well. But yeah, they didn't, cool at the time, people didn't feel like the engine was strategic so much. This is the era of portals, and we have you know finance and travel and search engine that are all equally valuable, which is completely not true. But before you understand advertising, they looked kind of equally true, and so those groups were happy to have us do the engine for them, thinking that they would make money in advertising and pay us a fee for the actual search, which they did. That was how the contract worked. Um, but that's the wrong model if your advertising partners won't actually share advertising revenue with you in a reasonable way over time. Yeah. And because if you're a search engine that's also a brand like Google became, you get to keep the ad revenue as the ad model gets sorted out and gets to be very large revenue. That revenue dwarfs what we could get by actually providing searches, even though technically it shouldn't. But again, because the market was in turmoil, it was very difficult to make that transition. And then what was it? I mean, I'm super curious. I, mean, I started in tech in 2008, so you've had a lot longer history than I have. What was it like? Yeah, having, I mean, it was successful right at that time and, and height. You had mentioned kind of the valuation of it. What was it like to go through that and to go like, live through the dot-com bubble <laughs> it was crazy up and crazy down um my crazy up i mean things like you know there was a day where the valuation went up more than the value of volvo i think of a volvo i'm just picking them because that's one i happen to notice that day uh ford was looking at acquiring volvo for like four billion dollars and you know we had a 25 billion dollar market cap on our peak something like that. So it just it came like uh, the word of the time was irrationally exuberant. And I think that's true on the upside. Uh, the part that actually hurt us most was not the search into space. It was the networking space. We had another product, which is uh, for kind of network caching and CDNs. And that was actually most of our revenue towards the end. Uh, but that market completely died in the internet bubble crash because it turns out all these players like Famous ones like WorldCom and Enron, they actually were in debt and they just collapsed. So people have heard about Enron, but you know, these are customers paying $10 million a quarter for services and they just disappeared and didn't come Disapp back. Yeah. The whole market yeah. just gone. And we never, never really could recover from that. And would you, yeah. Way I mean, down is how, quite how, difficult. <laughs> I've given whole talks yeah. on up and down of that. But up and down. But and, it was all paper yeah. money for me, unfortunately, because I was on the board. And once it starts going down, if you're on the board and you have a material event every 90 days, it's very difficult to sell. And so yeah. I actually made and lost a billion dollars on paper, but only on paper. 
I mean, we're kind of seeing that now, right? It's like, you know, we were just in this like up market for the last 12 years. And, and now we're seeing kind of all these employees, right? Founders that saw, you know, unicorn status on these, uh, on these startups. And now we're seeing them kind of like start to close, start to run out of what runway. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, man struck by how many of the people I work with, even at Google, haven't been through a downturn before, really. Right? You know, because of rapid growth, most companies have lots of young employees, which is great. It's good for everything. Uh, but the last downturn is 2008 or so, and, and this one seems so far not as bad as that one. Uh, and for internet companies, certainly not as bad as the internet bubble bursting so far, although it's much broader in, in, in what it's hitting. Uh, but I do think it's healthy to realize that these things are cyclic and you do change behavior in up and down markets. It doesn't, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give, give someone, uh, especially maybe starting in tech now or just, yeah, how you would approach valuation? I mean, again, you saw something go from over a billion to <laughs> a lot right. less. Uh, I would now say I'd have a first conversation first, which is, um, what stage of your life are you in when you think about what kind of company you want to be in in a downturn? Uh, if you're young enough and, for example, don't have kids, you should probably be, you know, take quite a bit of risk because, you know, a lot of these startups that are risky right now in a difficult environment, some of them will do great and come out of this. And if you are young enough to start over, that's probably a risk worth taking. Right. For me, I have, you know, kid in college, kid in high school. I actually like the stability of Google and can control my time. I can control my downside risk. It limits my upside risk. There's no way I can make the kind of return I could make in a startup that goes well. Uh, but for this period of my life, that's a good trade-off. And, and both matter. Right? I, the problem with being a startup at a downturn is you really don't have control over your time anymore. It's kind of all hands on deck. It's stressful for quite some time. And yes, you can get through it and you can work hard. And I did work hard, you know, multi outlier thing. Uh, and I don't regret it. But I did that at, you know, 27 versus when I'm now at 56. So it's a different yeah. era. Um, but it's really they're both great I mean, experiences. It's just where are you in your risk profile? I start with that. And then you can decide what kinds of risks you want to take, whether it's market risk or technical risk or Honestly, I would say what matters more than any of those things is the, is the quality of life things. Like, do you like the people you work with? And do you feel that, that there's enough of a meritocracy at your job that you can get the respect and kudos you deserve for work done well? Those are the cultural things in the companies that you work for. I think they're, they but you also seem my like someone, job enjoyment of life a lot. Yeah, you also seem like someone that enjoys learning, building, creating, right? So I think there's like an additional layer of that as well, right? Like what's kind of your risk tolerance where you are in your life, but also the, the layer of, do, do you want to be, right? Comfortable and just kind of keep building or uh, I like, I, I find like a little bit larger companies, you end up kind of just like, there's like a formula and you systematize and then you have budgets and then there's like way things are done, but versus kind of like the, the early days, it's a bit of chaos and unknown and, and the creation. Yeah, you need to and do a lot of everything in the early days for sure. And I do think that that's a valuable skill. And in fact, when I coach various people at different stages in their career, I talk about things like, you know, if you, you know, change this job or change this role, you know, what are the things you're going to get out of that change that are good for you, regardless of the other outcomes? What, what what things will you learn to, to kind of quote you? I do think that is valuable. I think about this in decades. I kind of like do something for about a decade and then I do something fairly different for about a decade. And I've done that now. Whew, that's how you count, but four or five times. Right? Only once within Google. I would say my first decade at Google, because I've been there about 11 years, was really about the, the creation and rise of Kubernetes. My yeah. current decade, if it's different from that, it's really about open source security and can we fix it for the world, which is a very difficult challenge. But it's, a, it's, a, it's related to Kubernetes, but it's not the same challenge. Before that, I did work in developing countries. Before that, I did Ink to Me. Before that, I did grad school. So those are kind of decade epochs where I feel like that decades are long enough to master something, get a, you know, see it up and down and through, but it's also short enough that you can do many decades of work in your life. You don't have to do all the things you want to do 
in one year. You have a lifetime to achieve it. That's such great advice, especially for people starting their careers where I think sometimes we rush through phases, right? So uh, enjoy, right? Enjoy where you're at. Enjoy, kind of understand that you're going to have a long career, right? That that's going to span many different type of experiences. And I think sometimes people are like always rushing. I'm like, oh, well, I joined the startup. I, I hope that IPO soon or I joined the startup. I, sh- I should be on this career path. And instead, it's like, how do you optimize kind of for, you know, whether it's learning or, um, I think that's right. And, and to give credit where credit is due, I learned this lesson from Guy Steele, and he learned it from his mom. I think his mom's quote is roughly, you can do all the things you want to do in life, you just can't do them at the same time. Yeah. Guy Steele, for people who don't know, is a famous Java developer that also did great work on supercomputing and many other things. And you can go find books by him. Yeah, I'm going to check them out after this. Incredible. And then, I mean, what keeps you going, right? You've had this like pretty incredible career spanning many well-known projects. Uh, what keeps you going? At this point, I'm looking for projects that, I, that if they go well, they have high impact. And I, you know, I, I certainly have enjoyed pretty much all the projects I've worked on, but the, the unifying thread is if this does what I want it to do, it's you know, there are projects do that would make me more money for sure than open source, but there aren't really projects that I feel like I'm in a good position to help. And if we can make some progress, it really is a big positive for the world. Yeah. So I'm at a point where I can take projects that have frankly higher risk and higher reward. So I don't know if I can solve this problem. I certainly can't do it by myself, Uh, Yeah. but that's a problem I think is worthy of working. And what is it about open source? That, that like you enjoy and, and well i think what's happened in the last 10 years is we've made it incredibly easy to use open source mostly through package managers and that's been great open source is now widely used even in proprietary software it's kind of all over the place the consequence of that fast growth though is we don't really know what we're using we don't understand our dependencies if there's a problem in a dependency we probably can't even find it let alone fix it and so I think, think we fixed some of these, most of these problems internally at Google, but not in a way that everyone else can benefit from. And to do it right needs industry cooperation. That's kind of where the Open Source Security Foundation came from, but also needs better tooling, better education. You know, this is kind of all this I started on before the, the cybersecurity executive order came from President Biden. But it's because I could kind of see these things coming that you know we're not in a safe place this came out of my work with Kubernetes, where Kubernetes yeah. had at the time like 1,200 dependencies. And you just look at the list, you're like, oh, I don't trust that. I don't trust that. That has one maintainer. That has one maintainer. But you can't bet the world's corporations on you know individual packages for maintainers that we don't know what the hell's going on. Do you think it took us too long to see? Like all of a sudden, we're, everyone's like doing the open core model. We're all adopting open source technologies. Uh, without kind of understanding that all of a sudden we're opening up ourselves to like these like security vulnerabilities? Well, I think people have been harping on security vulnerabilities all the time. And even like, you know, we had uh, open SL problems in 2014 and other times where we had kind of wake up calls that said, oh, this is bad. And we did make some small changes. But again, the growth of open source since that time even has been incredibly large. So it's really the, the risk profile has greatly increased. And frankly, the number of people using open source without understanding it has also increased. And that includes governments, for example, all kinds of companies that are now using open source because they like the free part without necessarily understanding the consequences. And I actually, I would, the best case is they wouldn't have to understand the consequences because through, you know, public works or support or paid uh, support, like for example, if you buy the Linux OS, you can get paid support you know, indirectly from Debian or Red Hat or you know, those groups do a good job for the packages they support, which is a small subset of the packages that we actually use. But at least yeah. there's a model there we can copy. I call that model curation. So there's a curator there that's helping you find open source that is at least vetted and has someone thinking about security patches. So that general direction is the right answer. The question is how do you cause curation to exist on a large scale? Well, speaking of security companies, Dan says hello. Dan from ChainGuard. <laughs> uh, he had introduced yeah, he used to us work with me on this very topic when he was at Google. Yes, <laughs> um, and I'm really curious. I mean, I, it's always important to look forward, not just you know the next year, couple years. I mean, 
you've seen kind of like the internet change and evolve, like what do you think are some other trends that we should be like paying attention to that are going to kind of like change the way that like businesses operate? It's a great question. There's a lot of hand wringing going on, especially in Europe about privacy and how to protect users. And at the same time, you know, users data is all over the place. And I think, you know, Google does frankly a pretty good job of letting you know what data we have about you and you can delete it. There's a transparency level there, which by the way, was, is there in part because the European government asked for it. And that, that's a fine kind of request. But this discussion is not near done. And it gets more complicated when you think about other devices, like, do you have a smart TV? Right? It's on the internet. Do, a, a, do you trust it? And what does it know about you? Well, it's, yeah. it knows quite a bit about you. Uh, it also is a security risk because you know it's a device with a microphone and a camera, and it's in your house, and it, it, it's connected to the internet. So there, there are kind of risks that we are taking on without much realization. I'll just say, personally, I have a smart TV, but it's not connected to the internet. I'm using it as a monitor. Uh, so it's a dumb TV. You just happen to be a very good TV. Uh, I hope that will change. I would like us to be able to trust all the devices in our house. But we are not there yet. And we're not. No. It's, it's part of this general trend of technology moves faster than we can understand it. And so we have to kind of learn by and example. regulate it. Things are bad and how to fix them. And, you know, don't but how, have to be how regulation. Do you, it can be by brands. Brands that care about the reputation should be making fixes in these directions. And I think they generally are. But, the, you know, there's a lot more to do. Yeah. And then how does a, a person that doesn't understand, you know, isn't fully technical know that, like, okay, I probably shouldn't, I should understand that my smart TV is gathering information on me and I should, that's something I should care about. It's a great question. All I can say is, you know, I've talked to US government folks about this and your kind of best bet is to try to get to some kind of star system where they can say, oh, this device at least allows, uh, has good security policies and has, you know, over the air updates or whatever they decide makes for a good device. And then you can say, oh, I'm gonna buy ones that are, you know, security certified or whatever that star ends up being, something like that. But that's, that is one approach. Uh, you can change liability. That's a risky approach. It's hard to enforce. Uh, but until consumers expect some security from their devices, it's not really going to get solved. And the open question, by the way, is will you pay more for a secure device? And you know, it's not clear that people will. So I think they should and should be willing to, but I don't, there's no track record for that. And by the way, it does it be cost more to make a secure device. If you want to do an over-the-air update, you need to have extra capabilities in the device itself to enable that. And so there's some cost to that. It's not zero. I would happily pay that cost, uh, but others may not. Yeah. But they should at least be transparent at what the risks are. Right now, people don't understand the risks, and it's not it's very not their fault. It's not easy to understand. I mean, yeah, I started working in tech in 2008. It, it's interesting to watch tech become mainstream in many ways, right? Or or the amount of people that have computers and cell phones, and uh, but how many? Like how many people still don't understand like the technology, like how to use it, what it's doing, what data it's collecting. Um, yeah, it's interesting to watch. Or even I suspect people don't even realize how much it's changed their lives. And it's not in the sense, the big sense, oh, I can use Google Maps and get places. That's awesome. And I can use an app to get someone to drive me somewhere. That's also awesome. But like what fraction of your free time is spent on your screen now? And is that something you're choosing consciously or not? Uh, are you seeing less of your friends? The data says you're seeing a lot less of your friends than you used to, especially in COVID years, but even before that, it was, it was trending downward, right? So maybe that's replaced with online social interactions, but that's not clear, nor is the code that those are equally clear. valuable. It was, uh, so my, my family's from Czech Republic, uh, from a small little town. And so I went and visited my family this year and so my grandpa and I went on a little trip. And so I was going to take my phone. I was like, okay, uh, Yeti, like, where should we go? I was going to put it in Google Maps. And he's like, oh, I got it. And I was like, oh. So he's just like, and then we just drove. And he's like, Yana, turn down this street. And then turn down this street. And then we got a little lost. So we rolled down the window and asked someone mm -hmm. where the like. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Like, you can actually navigate and get around in the world without technology. And so it was like a funny little realization of like, oh, I don't always need my phone to get, get around somewhere. 
Um, I'm really curious, like you have two children, right? You're someone that's been steeped in technology uh, pretty much your whole life. How, how do you kind of expose your kids to technology? It's a great question. About that? My answer might surprise people, which is I was relatively limiting of technology access. Um, I think a lot of parents feel like, oh, we need to get our kids accommodated to laptops and smartphones so that they'll be fully competent as you know adults. And I think that's not actually true. I'd rather my kids be fully competent at social interactions and they can pick up cell phones, computing, and even programming, you know, relatively late. Like our, our policy was kids got cell phones in eighth grade. That's late. <laughs> they got laptops earlier, laptops in sixth grade and, and cell phones in eighth grade. But I, I'm not claiming that's normal. I'm claiming that's late. But not too late to mean that they can't be programmers. In fact, my son is also a professional programmer before he went to college. And so his late start did not hurt him at all. That's incredible. That's and great plus advice. Plus it is, you know, they play guitar. They have great social interactions. They have high emotional IQ comparatively because they've done all the things that, that I did growing up kind of took, taking for granted. Like again, I started programming about age 12. You know, that, that was early at the time and certainly not late. If yeah. you learn programming at 12 or 16 now, that's not late either. It's early. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's, it's so funny. Uh, the kids are just missing out, right? I, still, I remember growing up and it's just like I would go hiking and spend a bunch of time in the woods and use your imagination. And, and now it's just, you know, you stare at your phone all day. So I think that's a really great, great way to raise your kids. It's, it's hard unless you're with a bunch of parents that have similar views. So we actually ended up finding a school where, you know, this kind of limited technology was part of the value of the school system. That made it a lot easier, right? Because if your kid's the only one that doesn't have a cell phone, it's way harder. So you need a community to make this work. And I'm not saying that's easy, but I think that's the most likely approach to work. I love that. Okay, we have maybe two more minutes left. And since this whole conversation started uh, as uh, me joking a little bit that I was like, can I have Eric Brewer explain the cap theorem to me? I feel like that, that'd be a great way to close if you're if you're okay with that as our final kind of Happy <laughs> to to. someone. Um, I'll just say, um, you know, this came out of teaching at Berkeley when I was teaching these various classes on student systems. And I just- How old were you in, in the your middle 20s? This was in, I was probably by this time, I was more like 30. Like this particular class I was teaching, this was somewhere around 97, maybe, 96. Um, so the, the, the essence of it is, you know, to have consistency, you want to have a single master copy of something. That's the easiest way to make something consistent have availability you kind of need at least two copies because one of the copies might go away good okay right. so if i have two copies and i want to keep them consistent i have to communicate between those two copies for every update right. and if i can't communicate between those two copies then i have to decide do i want to be available or do i want to be consistent i can keep them both up with no communication and they will evolve separately maybe i can reconcile it later that's eventual consistency or I can take one side down and the other side is by definition consistent, but the first side is unavailable. So those are your choices basically. And it turns out it has nothing to do with computers, it has to do entirely with communication and copies. And so it applies to humans, it applies to all systems. You see hints of it even in the kind of Renaissance banking where, you know, how do you make sure that, you know, a bank statement is reconciled? It's gonna have to be eventually consistent. That's why you have wax seals and a witch updates are legitimate or not uh, and so it's, it's not a we think about it as a modern problem but actually by default world has always chosen availability and choosing consistency was only relatively recently even an option because it requires networking incredible well thank you eric it's such a pleasure i mean i know we just met you're like who is this woman um but thank you for your contributions to <laughs> the thank internet you. and um, Very kind thank you and... for being you appreciate you <laughs> <laughs> have a nice afternoon Great meeting thanks you so much for your time you, you too bye eric <laughs>